Have you ever wondered if running will wear out your knees? Perhaps you've had a well-wisher tell you that running will wear out your knees. Well, it may surprise you to learn that the overall prevalence of hip and knee osteoarthritis in recreational runners is 300% less than that of sedentary individuals. All this and more in this week's expert edition of the Physical Performance Show, exploring the theme, Is Running Bad for My Knees? Hi, it's J.F. Escudier, physiotherapist and PhD on running injuries and knee pain, exploring the topic of is running bad for your knees, and you're listening to the Physical Performance Show. And the is failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by the upcoming Master Athletes Online Symposium. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. We do this across a range of different episodes, interest editions, coaches' corners, featured performers, and expert editions. And on today's episode, you'll hear from Canadian-based physical therapist and prolific running researcher, J.F. Esculier, on our central theme, Is Running Bad for My Knees? By way of bio, J.F. Esculier is the clinical assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. He is the head of research and development and speaker at the running clinic. And in industry circles, you can't go past good running injury research without J.F. Esculier's name being somewhere amongst it. J.F. is listed as one of the 15 world-class experts at the upcoming The Physical Performance Show co-hosted Masters Athletes online one-day symposium. So we thought it'd be a great opportunity to showcase this conversation with J.F. Esculier around a topic that few people know more about on the planet, and that is the relationship of running and knee slash hip osteoarthritis. On this conversation, you'll hear JF share around the misconceptions about running and knee osteoarthritis, the findings of current research into the relationship between running with known symptomatic and asymptomatic knee osteoarthritis. JF issues guidelines on what to do if you do have known symptomatic knee osteoarthritis to promote the best future of your joints. Issues a great physical challenge for the week. And as you'll hear at the top of the show, please, please, please do go ahead and complete JF's knee and hip osteoarthritis and running survey that he's compiling with his researching colleagues. It's available in seven languages and I'll direct you to the show notes, pogophysio.com.au forward slash podcast or JF over on Twitter at JF Escoulier and there you'll find the survey link. It's very important work. They need thousands of responses. So please, physical performance, show. Loyal listeners, let's get behind the survey and assist them with this important work. But for now, let's jump in with a notepad and pen for the many learnings from J.F. Escoulier on this central theme, is running bad for my or your knees? J.F. Escoulier, welcome to the Physical Performance Show for this expert edition on all things is running bad for my knees? Hey, Brad, thanks for having me on the show. That's a great question and certainly a question that I get all the time as a physio. And uh, your background, JF, uh, you're prolific in the space. If you work in the field of uh, running-related rehabilitation, your name will pop up more frequently than not. Uh, your PhD uh, was completed in looking at minimalist shoes, uh, you've done a lot of work in kneecap related pain, uh, gait retraining, you're quite prolific. To put the listener of the show in context, 
of your work to date. Uh, can you uh, paint a bit of a, a broad brushstroke around your career to date? Yeah, well, I'm uh, first and foremost, I'm a clinician. So I'm a physiotherapist who loves working with people. And when I started working in the clinic, I was working with a lot of runners and I had a lot of questions um, to myself that I couldn't find answers in the research. So I decided to get involved. Um, so I've been combining clinical work a couple of days a week uh, for the past 11 years now with some research. Um, so like you said, Brad, research on running biomechanics, uh, running footwear, uh, knee pain, how do we treat people with knee pain, what are the best pieces of advice we can give them or exercises or uh, gait modifications and all that stuff. Um, so I started with patellofemoral pain, which is kneecap pain that we see in, in younger people. And then I decided to do a postdoctoral fellowship um, on knee osteoarthritis. So how can we apply those concepts maybe to older runners, masters runners, and, um, and help them get better because we see more and more runners who are aging obviously and they want to stay active and uh, and it's really uh, something that i'm passionate about and it's such a key contribution that your research and your passions making because as you just noted jf there is a rise in aging the masters runner uh worldwide We've seen the average age of runners increase over the decades by about plus five, uh, if I, if I you know, am studying literature correctly. And you only need to look at any recreational, local event to see people running longer in life, which, given the health benefits, is a fantastic thing. Absolutely. And, you know, not everyone will like to run, um, but some people would want to run, but they're told that maybe running is bad for their knees. And, uh, and I think we may have to tell a different message. Uh, and, you know, uh, to that uh, matter, I would say, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, this, this podcast, I would invite you to fill out a survey study that we're doing now, uh, which is assessing the perceptions that people have about running and knee health. So is running good for your knees? Is running bad for your knees? Uh, and I'm sure we can post the link uh, before you just keep going with this podcast to make sure you're not biased in your responses so try to do it now if you can just press uh, press pause and, and take uh take a few minutes to uh, to complete that <laughs> and it's interesting you mentioned that jf because uh i completed this survey as a as a sports physio here in australia it's open to uh professionals it's open to runners of all levels with and without knee known osteoarthritis and uh i did think uh, the end of the survey is a fantastic education module of about 10 uh, units from uh, recollection there. And I thought, well, if people listen to the podcast first, as you say, J JF, their answers may be biased. So in all seriousness, stop the podcast, uh, jump over to pogophysio.com.au, find the show notes and uh, and take this survey. We'll also pop it up prolifically in social, on social media. It'll take you no more than 10 minutes and, uh, and then come back to the podcast. So uh, after everyone's completed that, JF, and hopefully there's a swell in the number of uh, of survey respondents there let's explore the topic so i mean let's start with the, the, the overarching theme or guide for our conversation is is running bad for for my knees uh we hear this you don't have to travel far to hear this uh non-running friends uh people on the sidelines even health professionals it's prolific uh we're going to debunk that today looking at the literature uh but be before we even do that jf what is a knee osteoarthritis and uh and what are the what are the signs of it yeah knee osteoarthritis uh i like to describe it as simply aging of the joints uh, just like any tissues in your body will will age uh, normally it's changes that happen in your joints um and mainly, uh, so the knees and the hips are, are quite frequently affected by that. So the changes will happen in the cartilage, in the bone, um, even in, in all the structures of the joint, and that could lead to pain. Um, so the clinical diagnosis, the way we diagnose it in the clinic is to have a combination of 
symptoms, so pain, stiffness, um, and to have the changes on an x-ray. So the x-ray would show changes in your bones uh, and in the joint. Um, now, a lot of people will have you know, features of knee osteoarthritis on imaging, but they will not have pain or symptoms necessarily. So we need to uh, just keep in mind that uh, sometimes your imaging results can show something, but it doesn't mean that you will have pain necessarily. But if you do, then it will affect uh, your quality of life. It will affect your, your level of, of uh, physical activity because of pain. But keep in mind, a lot of people out there show features of knee OA on imaging, but they don't have pain, which means that if you do have that and you have symptoms, if you do have changes on x-ray, you can still go back to a state where there will be no pain. So it's it's something that can be treated well most of the time. Uh, so don't panic if that's your case. Such important information. And uh, what changes might people expect, or not expect, sorry, but see on a, on plain film imaging or x-rays as, as people commonly refer to them? Yeah, uh, I mean, so the changes typically will be what we call uh, reduced joint space so the the bones will come a little bit closer together uh, and i never use the words bone on bone because i <laughs> i don't think it's the good way of putting it uh, it's just that the cartilage is getting a little bit thinner um, and uh, you'll see changes in the bone so the bone will be uh, a little bit will become a little bit wider typically just to try and and um, spread, distribute that load through basically a bigger joint. Uh, so you'll get what we call osteophytes, which is just the bone trying to get a little bit wider uh, and sometimes just bone cysts as well. Um, so it's just, um, you know, different features that you will see. But again, keep in mind that a lot of people have that, their x-rays can show that. Uh, however, they will have no pain. Um, so it's not the end of the world if that's your case. And then we, we usually have grades. Uh, so the Kellgren and Lawrence scale is the one that we use most of the time. Uh, so that's grade one, two, three, and four that go from mild to, um, to severe um, knee OA. Um, so usually, you know, if, because the end point is, is a surgery and some people, not everyone, but some people will get a surgery. Uh, no one would get a surgery really for a grade two. You'll, you'll need a grade four, right? You'll have to, uh, to have quite severe imaging results. Uh, but it's just the end of the, of the, as you know, Brett, of the therapeutic road there. There's a lot of other things that we can do before that as uh, in physio and rehab that will be really, really helpful. Such as uh, encouraging people to run uh, with, with, with in, in the right, when I say the right manner, mainly with the right introduction if it's, uh, if it's a, a new runner or with some parameters and understanding if it's uh, someone that's more seasoned, which we'll certainly explore today. And, and JF, just to, to, to clarify and I guess highlight that point, we would expect to see changes that you outlined there on, on x-ray, even in people that don't have reported or experiential symptoms of knee osteoarthritis and the percentages are quite high, aren't they, of, of these changes in asymptomatic people, people that don't have knee pain. Can you put us in the ballpark of what percentage of people above and below 40 years of age, 40 years of age, may have osteoarthritic uh, presentation on x-ray? Yeah, I mean, ballpark, uh, 40 years old and more, there would be 40 to 50 percent of people who can have changes in um, on x-ray and have no pain. So there's a bunch of studies now comparing the features found on x-ray in people with and without symptoms. Because as you know, Brad, we used to think, you know, if someone comes to our clinic and they have pain, they get imaging, we'll say, oh, you know, that's why you have pain because we can see this on your x-ray. But actually, some studies started in also investigating people without pain, just that normal person walking on the street. And we found out that, well, there's a bunch of people out there who also have those changes on x-ray and, and they feel totally fine. So we're talking about 40 to 50 percent um, of people who would have those changes on x-ray and have no pain. Which is why we can be so encouraged if, uh, if we are symptomatic that 
your structure doesn't necessarily dictate the function or what you can expect. Uh, recently featured expert uh, on an expert edition, JF, uh, Ebony Rio, uh, tendinopathy, obviously well-known researcher, world acclaimed. She mentioned uh, that in her one takeaway tip, every cell of the body is capable of adaptation until the day we die. So I think that's uh, encouraging when it comes to knee osteoarthritis as well. Absolutely, and I would totally agree with that. Uh, we can delve a little bit more into that, but people tend to think that cartilage, for example, cannot adapt. Um, so I'm sure uh, Ebony was talking about tendinopathy and, and tendon cells, uh, but cartilage is, is the big thing that people talk about in, in OA. Um, and people think, you know, you have this, this much cartilage and you can only wear it out with activity, which is not true at all. And some recent research suggests that cartilage can adapt and get stronger with physical activity. Right, so there's different different tissues will adapt differently, obviously, but um, there's one quite interesting study by um, Hans van Ginkel in in Belgium, and what they did is to take uh, 19 sedentary individuals and um, ask 10 of them to start a running program. So just a 10 week running program. And the other nine, they just stayed sedentary during those 10 weeks. And they took an MRI before and after that start to run program. And what they noticed was that people who started running only after only 10 weeks, they had changes in their cartilage. And there's certain molecules in the cartilage. And in that case, it was glycosaminoglycans or GAG. Uh, that were um, that had a higher concentration in the cartilage after 10 weeks of starting to run. So it's not the kind of change that you can see on normal imaging, right? It's like research um, research imaging that allows you to see that. But what it tells us is that those molecules that we know help to attract water in the cartilage and help its structural strength. Uh, they can make cartilage more tolerant to loading just by stimulating it with impact. Which is very encouraging uh, for the known knee osteoarthritis or hip osteoarthritis sufferer. And it's an example, isn't it, of every cell in the body being capable of adaptation. Uh, so you, you mentioned there, JF, that you can't wear the cartilage out with activity. I mean, that is seemingly a timelessly, a timeless ongoing perpetuated belief uh, that I started triathlon at 10 years of age in about 1990 and uh, and that was the overarching belief and an underlying fear I had I had people telling me at 11 when I was doing you know triathlons of 1k 30k ride 8k runs that I was too young I would wear out my knees Keep him down. Don't let him do that distance. So, I mean, it was there in the 1990s, uh, and I think it's still all pervasive. So where does that belief come from that you'll wear your cartilage out uh, if you run in your knees? Uh, you know, Brad, I have no idea where it comes <laughs> from, uh, to be honest. And, you know, when you think about it, uh, you go to the gym because you want to make your muscles stronger. So you'll say, you know, I'll, I'll lift weights, I'll stimulate my muscles, and everybody knows that your muscles will get, will get bigger and stronger if you do that. But for whatever reason, people think that if you stimulate your joints, they will just wear out. And, and I'm not sure where it comes from. Uh, but the reality is that joints, they, they, like you said, they adapt just as much as muscles. They're just slower because it depends on the kind of tissues that you're trying to get to adapt. But in, in joints, it's, it's just slower, but they can still adapt. And to define cartilage, I, I think there's a lot of uh, misconceptions around what cartilage in the knee is. Uh, people have often heard of meniscus, you know, and uh, I hear a lot of terminology bantered around that I wore out my cartilage or I tore my cartilage. How would you, JF, just in simple terms, uh, outline what 
the cartilage actually is. Yeah, the, the cartilage is a, a structure or a tissue that's meant to reduce friction between two bones. Um, so technically, it's supposed to be frictionless um, so that when you're using your joints, they don't heat up, basically. Uh, but it's uh, it's just that thin layer in between the bones that allow you to move a bit easier. And like you said, there's different types of cartilage too, right? So in the knee, for example, well, you'll have the the hyaline cartilage that's just the articular articular cartilage and then you'll have the meniscus which is uh, you know a different type of cartilage in there so you have different structures but overall uh, in the knee for example that would be just that that thin layer uh, that helps to uh, to move better basically and so it exists in the knee it exists at all all joints in the body and if we focus on this expert edition today around the topic of is running bad for my knees you said that you can't wear the cartilage out with activity so jf there's probably people listening in thinking but i know a friend or someone who is likely far down on that classification grade four perhaps on imaging uh barely able to take a stair up or down severely limited and they are on the wait list for uh, a knee joint replacement or you know uh an arthroplasty surgery can we just uh speak on the continuum you've got that level of continuum you've got people with changes that aren't symptomatic uh like we mentioned before how would someone that is at that grade four stage what advice would you give to them around running jf yeah um so you know if First of all, if you're younger and you say, you know, I, I would like to run, but I'm scared that I'm just going to wear out my knees. Um, well, I'll say if you're gradual enough, if, you know, you're increasing um, and you're listening to your body. So meaning if you have knee pain, you won't push through it. There's no risk there at all. Um and we can chat about that later, but um, obviously running may even be protective for your knees. So we can come back to that after. But if you do have, you know, you have like a grade two OA, for example, on imaging and you do have symptoms, uh, I get that all the time. You know, if I keep running, is that going to make me worse? Is it going to progress to a point where I need that joint replacement surgery. And um, it doesn't seem like it. So based on the research that we have now, it seems like you know, you take a bunch of people with knee OA, uh, some of them are runners, some of them are not. And um, you follow them for four years and it seems like four years down the road, there's no more progression of the radiographic features uh, in people who keep running, there's no more progression of symptoms. And, uh, and I think that's an important message because if you're passionate about running, you're listening to your body quite well, you don't push through pain, then you can, you can maintain running even, uh, you know, at age 50, 60, 70, if you have, if you do have OA on imaging. So that would be a very, um, I would say very important for you to keep doing it even because you're still loading your cartilage and you don't want to say I'll stop everything because I don't want to wear out my cartilage. It just doesn't work like that. So just to, to reiterate, the younger runner or perhaps someone with known grade two changes in their knee, uh, the advice would be to continue to run uh, on the basis that further running doesn't necessarily progress changes on imaging or symptoms yeah that's correct in other so words it's keep going in other words it's safe <laughs> absolutely it is safe it is safe as long as again you listen to your body um, because if you say well you know i'll I have knee pain and I just signed up for an ultra marathon in the mountains and, uh, you know, you, you may have a, a severe flare up and maybe that would be an overload for your joint. And, and as we know, overloading the joint may not be ideal for that progression of OA, uh, just as, you know, overloading it with one trauma. For example, if you're playing football, you're playing uh, whatever sport and you're twisting your knee, you're creating a trauma in your, your knee, that's a risk factor to develop OA and that's pretty well documented. So if you're doing that one 
uh, movement where you're you're creating a trauma, not ideal. So if you're basically having a way and you say, you know, I'm just going to load my knee, overload my knee with uh, an ultra marathon, even if I have knee pain, that may not be ideal. Yeah, and I, and I have re- read uh, in, in a paper by Miller that they sort of cite unusual loads as perhaps more problematic than uh, the load magnitudes. So, to, to, you know, and unusual loads they just described as loads that produce stress on the joint, uh, not conditioned to sustaining that now must be sustained on, a, on an ongoing basis. So I guess the runner, like you mentioned, who's taken on an ultra marathon with known knee symptoms and pain, uh, looking to continue to do that, it may not be wise. Exactly. And, you know, the basically the incidence uh, of OA uh, may be related to your, your running habits also. And uh, there's that massive study that I think you're aware of, Brad, that massive uh, systematic review that was conducted and, well, published in 2017 by Alan Torn Jelly. Um, and they had over 125,000 people included in in that uh, systematic review, and they they categorized people in in three different categories. So number one is recreational runners. Number two was um, more controls, non-runners, sedentary people, and competitive runners. And they looked at uh, you know how many people in those different categories showed changes on x-ray that were uh, related to knee OA. Uh, so it was knee and hip, so for both. And interestingly, they found that, you know, the non-runners or sedentary people had a 10% prevalence of hip and knee OA. Um, competitive runners, it was a little bit higher, so it was 13%. And the non, uh, sorry, the recreational runners were 3.5%. So it's, you know, if you're running recreationally, this study suggests that you may reduce your risk of OA just because you're loading the joint in a way that it will be able to adapt. And uh, and by the way, competitive runner here, just to make sure people understand, in that study, it's not if you're trying to beat your three hours on marathon, <laughs> okay? Like, it's great if you're competitive like that, like with yourself and in your age group and all that, it's great. But their definition was that if you're running for your country, if you're a carded athlete or international level athlete, so it's a really high level that may increase that uh, prevalence of OA. For example, the you know elite runner with a high volume history and high intensity history maybe running 100 miles a week were the uh defined elite runners there and it was 33 percent as you say jf in the competitive runners the the prevalence of hip and knee oa 10 percent in the sedentary non-running population so they're kind of on par aren't they the same prevalence for sedentary and the elites but then as you say just three or 3.5 percent uh, three times less for the recreational runner. And really that means that the definition of a recreational runner, JF, is anyone that's not running for their country. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Which is great news for, you know, the 99.9999% of people that get out there and run. The, the elite runner <laughs> is a rare true. animal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you run, you know, you, you run your uh, three times a week, uh, five kilometers, uh, or you run up to 50, 60 kilometers a week, uh, or even more, yeah, you're, you're uh, recreational. And that's great. You count in those stats. And just to reiterate, three times less prevalence of knee and hip osteoarthritis if you are a recreational runner than that is people correct. that don't yes. run. So in other words, you nearly can't afford to not run for the, the health of your knees and hips across your lifespan. Would you agree? <laughs> I would definitely agree with that. I, I think running is great for your knees. Um, and again, if you're, if you're listening to your body and you're doing it well, uh, it is a great activity to maintain healthy joints so absolutely go ahead and run you're listening to jf escoulier clinical assistant professor at the university of british columbia on this and expert edition exploring the theme is running bad for our knees
Support for today's show comes from the upcoming One Day Masters Athletes Online Symposium. This symposium is being co-hosted by the Physica Performance Show, along with prior featured expert of the show, UK Extended Scope Practitioner Physiotherapist, Benoit Matthew. The aim of this one-day symposium is to equip symposium attendees with the latest and greatest information around how to master master's athletes. The speaking faculty is really quite impressive. Featured speakers include Dr. Rich Willey, Dr. Stacey Sims, J.F. Escoulier himself, Professor Peter Rayburn, Dr. Richard Blagrove, Dr. Bart Dinnigan, sports psychiatrist Dr. Amit Mystery, and many, many more. Topics explored include the female Masters athlete, long-term consequences of ACL injury, considerations for the Masters triathlete, rehabilitation of cycling injuries, navigating proximal hamstring tendinopathy, regenerative therapies, and physiological considerations for Masters athletes. In short, if you're 35 years plus, don't miss this free event. Jump over to masterathletes.online. M-A-S-T-E-R-A-T-H-L-E-T-E-S dot online. Masterathletes.online. Registration is free and following the event, VIP passes for a low £49 will be available to access the entire library of materials plus some fantastic bonus materials as well. For now, let's jump back with JF Escoulier on this an expert edition of the Physica Performance Show, exploring the central theme, is running bad for our knees. Uh, JF, if we're just on this theme of some of the the papers and literature, which, you know, you are so deeply steeped in, there was that I found terrific and exciting uh, a paper that came out by Horger et al. in 2019 about can marathon running improve knee damage of middle-aged adults where they looked at 82 novice runners uh, doing a debut marathon with a 16-week program. Can you share some of the findings of that? Because I found that to be really quite exciting. Yeah, that study was uh, was a bit surprising at first because, you know, no one was expecting it. <laughs> they were basically saying that... Um, if if you run a marathon, you can make your you can improve the different features in your knee, um, and and obviously if you look into the, the details of the results, it seems like some structures and some people they got a bit more swelling here and there, uh, and other ones it seems like the the lesions or the you know the the different things you would see on MRI that you would say oh this is uh, um, damage in the knees, uh, it got better in some of these people. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the main message is that um, the knee is, well, the joint is a structure that can change and it can change both ways. It can improve and it can also get a little bit worse. And it, it's hard on a cohort like that to say, you know, to apply those results to everyone out there. But I think, like I said, my main message is usually it will not make things worse necessarily if you're listening to your body. And some people, uh, and we don't know about their levels of pain in that study either, but, you know, if you had changes uh, on MRI, maybe they were related to pain and maybe it's because you push through pain. Um, and, and some other people, maybe they just listen to their body really well and they, uh, they got better. So they improved features on the MRI. Uh, and I think that's, that's the key point here is running is not bad for your knees and it may even be good for your knees. And that study is kind of a, a snapshot of that. You mentioned there, JF, just to reiterate, it will not, uh, it will not make you worse necessarily if you are listening to your body. The, the, the extension of that is, of course, how would you advise someone to listen to their body when it comes to their knee health or pain? Mm-hmm. Um, here, I, I mean, it would depend on age too, right? Uh, and as we know, if, if you had you had knee pain for, let's say, 10 years and you're, uh, you're in your 30s, well, maybe it would be time to, to address it and uh, not keep pushing through your pain. And what that means is technically you, your knees shouldn't hurt when you run, right? Especially if you're younger. And um, the advice I like to use is on that uh, good old scale of zero pain to 10 out of 10 pain, right? Well, 10, 10 out of 10 is 
the worst pain imaginable. Um, I like it when people don't go over that two out of 10 when they run. And um, if that pain, it has to be back to baseline or pre-running level within an hour after. And if the pain stays for longer than that, usually it's because you're overloading it. And um, because if the pain stays for longer, then you may create a little bit of swelling in your knee that's also related to that overload. And you don't want to reach that point because that could trigger maybe some, some changes longer term in your knee. Uh, now, if you're an older runner, I, I like to use kind of the same um, the same thresholds, but I will also tell them, you know, the following morning when you get up, uh, you want to make sure that there's no more stiffness because if you get older, you, you know exactly what I mean by stiff joints when you get up in the morning. You don't want any increase in that. So having, you know, feeling a little bit of something during your knees can be fine when you run as long as it's back to pre-running level within an hour after i think that's the key point yeah that's uh, so practical jf uh and then with the older athlete the older runner that extra caveat or uh, scorecard if you like which is is there any increase in stiffness the morning after absolutely and if you do have a way and you know about it no increase in swelling uh the day after so i think you know those those points are really key in knowing if you're doing it right or not. Uh, and because listening to your body, some people may say, you know, no pain, no gain, uh, which I totally hate in, uh, in, you know, in people with knee pain. Uh, I think it's the worst thing you could do to say, I'll just push through it. Uh, it's just not ideal. So no pain, no gain doesn't hold tight here, but certainly those great tips you've shared are a guide in light. JF, in terms of the loads at the knee, uh, as I've looked into this over the years of my professional life, I've, it's quite surprising that we would perceive running as high load loading on at the knee joint. Yet, can you paint a picture around, you know, how it actually relates, how it uh, uh, correlates or compares, if you like, to the forces of that occur at the knee when we walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you have two main joints in in your knee, right? So you have the kneecap one, and you have the main uh, the main joint that we call the tibiofemoral joints. And those two joints, let's say when you're walking, uh, you would get about one to two times body weight at your kneecap, um, up to potentially two to three times body weight at your your big knee joint, the tibiofemoral joint. When you're running, uh, it goes up to five times, between four and six times body weight at the kneecap, and can go up to 10 times body weight at the tibiofemoral joint. So, uh, you know, is it high loads or not? If you put it that way, yeah, it, it is high loads. But, you know, is it too much load for the body to adapt? Absolutely not. And, uh, and there's, like you mentioned earlier, there's also a you know, the cumulative load, so how much total body weights you're applying over the course of one run. Uh, and some people think that this might be related to um, to the development of, of knee OA. Uh, the answer is we don't really know, but uh, for sure, if you go beyond your, your joints capacity to adapt, then it may lead to, the, to some changes in your joint. And on the cumulative loads, uh, JF, uh, fellow running researcher and featured expert edition of the show, Rich Willie, highlighted that the cumulative loads of a walk for a given distance at the knee can be on par with the cumulative loads at the knee for the same distance with running. Can you just share a little bit about how that's possible? <laughs> yeah, um, that's a great point, Brad. And, and obviously, if you're walking, you're taking shorter steps, right? So to cover the same distance, if you're going for, let's say, a five-kilometer walk, which is a quite long walk, then you will need uh, a lot more steps than if you're running that five kilometers. So if you're multiplying the amount of load per step by the number of steps, you may get to a value that, that's quite close to one another. So walking versus running, the cumulative load will not be that different. Because many people would say, 
my knees are sore, I should walk rather than run because it's less load on my knee and the perception is that it will be better for the knee, but that's not necessarily the case. Not necessarily the case. However, I would say, you know, uh, clinically, my approach um, with runners with OA is to try and get them to load their knee joint a little bit more repetitions that have less load at a time, especially if your joint is irritated. If you do have um, you know, a bit more pain, you're in a flare up, for example, what you want to do is decrease that peak load because that peak load may irritate your knee joint a little bit more. And that's if you do have pain right now. Why? Because we know that cartilage adapts better or tends to respond better to um, compression that would be a bit more frequent, but of less magnitude. So less intense compression, but do it a little bit more often. It tends to, uh, to adapt uh, better to that or to tolerate it better, I would say. So would that look like practically JF, a runner, was planning to do a 60-minute run, a one-hour run, and that you might advise that they split that into, for example, two 30-minute runs? Absolutely. Uh, so typically, if you tell me, you know, I'm running 30 kilometers a week, which would be three times 10 kilometers or three times one hour during my week, I'll get you to run five or six times during your week instead. And that may be the same overall 30 kilometers, but splitting that up and spreading, distributing the load into more sessions will help the joint to uh, react better. So distributing the load across more sessions, if you're symptomatic, if you're not symptomatic, then there's no need for that approach or would you still advise that uh i mean in in the recreational runner um i would not necessarily tell people they should do that uh if your goal is to add more volume to your training because you're training for an ultra marathon or even for a marathon uh you can run seven times eight times nine times per week it's totally fine so you know running what we call a double unit so twice during the same day uh, can be quite helpful because you get the mechanical adaptation so you're stimulating your joint but you're reducing the likelihood of, of overloading it when you're reaching those levels where you're running more mileage during a week um, so it, it can be quite helpful in people without pain too but I would say only if they're at a level uh, at which the um, you know they're reaching closer to their maximum capacity to adapt, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So if they're up near that upper level there of adaptation, then uh, you would suggest that they don't need to, uh, or they do need to. Sorry, JF, consider you know making the sessions a bit more frequent and, and, and splitting that apart yeah yeah absolutely i mean if you're training for a long distance you still want to keep your long run and mm. you know your specific training for your longer distance but uh at other times during your week feel free to just distribute that load and go for more frequent runs that will uh, will be a bit shorter jf great advice if if we uh look at the pain of knee osteoarthritis what what would you how would you describe what's the driver for that pain where's the pain actually coming from in the knee joint uh i've had some uh, patellofemoral issues over the years where i've had uh some trochlear groove lesions a region of the uh the knee anatomy there uh with substantial bone marrow edema or fluid on the bone if you like and uh, I was once told to, well, there's a lot of fluid there, take a good period of running off, six months, uh, and it will settle down. Uh, I did did that. Uh, it's, it uh, s- stayed sore, and then about a year later, it settled down with a return to running. Uh, yet I had another MRI, JF, because I had a bone stress injury of my femur, and on the report was still a florid or a large amount of bone marrow edema, yet I was not sore in my kneecap anymore. So at that point, I let go of the idea that the fluid on the bone must be the the, the, the reason why my knee was sore. 
That's a great example, Brad. <laughs> Sometimes we're you know, we're wondering, oh, where does the pain come from? Um, and, and it's a great question. And I wouldn't say that scientists know exactly at this stage. And it's it's a mix probably of different features. And some people, yes, it can be those bone marrow lesions or um, you know, kind of a what we call subchondral edema. So a bit of swelling inside the bone because it's not coming from the cartilage, right? So the cartilage itself has no nerves, has no blood vessels. So it cannot be the source of your pain. But the bone that's just underneath that cartilage uh, can have a little bit of swelling here and there in the bone. And if you increase the pressure in the bone, uh, what we know is that bones are highly innervated and that can produce pain potentially. But your example <laughs> speaks to uh, maybe a different mechanism and that could be um, from the synovium or the synovial membrane uh, around the knee joint. Uh, and that membrane is basically what's holding uh, some liquid inside the joint, the lubricant uh, and all the, the liquids that uh, contain nutrients for the joint to adapt and function better. And sometimes you will get um, a bit of inflammation of that layer of that membrane and that can produce pain. So if you do have, um, you know, if your knee is, is all uh, swollen and you have kind of a, a bigger knee, usually it's because you have some swelling inside that membrane and that can be the trigger or the, the pain, basically. It's so interesting because I think most people would uh, demonize the cartilage as the source of pain, yet, as you mentioned, uh, it's actually not, not the case. JF, if we look at advising the runner with known knee osteoarthritis on how to continue across their lifespan running, noting that running is actually good and can be protective against progression uh, and the development of knee osteoarthritis, uh, how would you, what other things are important? I mean, uh, the role of medications, uh, what would be your advice around use or, or not of uh, medications? Well, yeah, I mean, the medications is, is out of my scope of practice. So what I tell people typically is you shouldn't load your knee to a point where you need that medication, right? So sometimes the medication is, like, is necessary, anti-inflammatories can be helpful, but um, if you feel like you, you keep needing it, it's probably because you're doing something wrong. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the loading environment is key here. And if you say, I've got some swelling in my knee, uh, it just won't go away, but you know, I'm, I'm running right now 30 kilometers a week. Well, maybe you should change something in your running training. And, you know, sometimes it could be extreme, like your, your own example, Brad, of, you know, I stopped running, uh, for a while, uh, six months is quite long. Uh, I, I rarely uh, go to that stage, but it happens where I tell runners with, oh, hey, you know, uh, just take a couple of weeks off, just take a month off. Sometimes it's two months and, uh, and then we're just going to build it up gradually. But in the meantime, uh, you can still cycle, you can do exercises to strengthen your legs and all of that. So it's, you know, it's a multifaceted approach that involves first controlled loading um, and listening to your body. And then um, doing some strengthening with that, ideally. We know based on research that strengthening is really helpful to help people with, with OA. Um, and then there could be other changes, for example, to the way you're running uh, or to footwear or uh, any other feature. But my number one is definitely um, changing the loading environment. So how much you're doing what's too much. Maybe you're, you're overloading the joint constantly and that just uh, keeps the swelling in there and because of that you need, you feel like you need your medication. But uh, if you address that part, quite often you will not need that medication anymore because you're not overloading it. So ongoing use or the requirement or the need for ongoing use of medication should be a bit of a, a flag to people that uh, the obvious is probably not being dealt with, and that's the the training environment, the amount of loading. Absolutely, and if that's the case, well, 
do just like we were talking earlier. So try to split your training into more sessions. Try to run a little bit slower even. if you Because we know, like we were talking earlier, there's more peak load going to your knee joint if you're running faster. So if you're running a little bit slower and that could be your normal is six minutes per kilometer, well, I'll get you to 6.30 per kilometer. If your normal is 4.30, I'll get you to five minutes per kilometer. So just a little bit um, a little bit slower, not a huge amount. You can do walk, run instead. Again, just to uh, load, unload, load, unload. Uh, you can uh, avoid downhill running. That's quite useful as well because we know that if you run downhill, you'll get more uh, peak loading as well. Uh, and that's my usual clinical approach, uh, basically trying to reduce that peak loading, but still loading the joint. And once your body tells you, yeah, it, it feels fine, meaning pain during is, is minimal, uh, the pain doesn't stay for more than an hour after, and there's no stiffness that following morning, no increase in stiffness, I should say, uh, then you're good to increase gradually and, and just listen to your body. You're listening to J.F. Esculier, Clinical Assistant Professor of the University of British Columbia on this, an expert edition of the Physical Performance Show, exploring the central theme, is running bad for our knees. If you missed last week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, it was another expert edition, exploring the intriguing world of respiratory muscle strength training for performance. It featured Australian-based physiotherapist and exercise physiologist, James Fletcher. If you've ever wondered what role breathing plays in our sports performance, then be sure to jump over and enjoy the episode in full. And whilst there, peruse the archives, dating right back to episode one featuring Ironman surf lifesaving champion, Ali Day. For now, let's jump back with this week's featured guest, J.F. Esculier, on this An Expert Edition. Is running bad for our knees? What would be some uh, just overarching principles of strength work you'd like to see a runner adopt uh, for no knee osteoarthritis, symptomatic sore knees? Um, well, at first, I like to get them to do some work that will not, again, increase the symptoms, right? So mm -hmm. if you have a bit of a flare-up, you don't want to do uh, very high load squats or jump squats because that may just irritate the joint some more. So if that's the case, I'll start with some uh, hip strengthening, so hip abductors, hip extensors. Uh, they could be non-weight bearing at first. If your joint is irritated, uh, they could be side planks with leg lifts. They could be uh, bridges, uh, hip thrusts, and, and movements like that that will load up your hip muscles but not overload the, the, the knee joint um, in terms of compression. And if it's well tolerated, if you're, the compression or weight bearing is well tolerated, then we'll go to some squats and lunges, but with added weights. Right, so what we want is to make your quadriceps stronger. Uh, we want again your hips, your hip muscles to be stronger, uh, hamstrings as well. So you know the muscles that are around the knee. What we know for sure is that if you make them stronger, you will get uh, better and you'll have less symptoms of OA. Um, so we don't know exactly how it works or why it works, but we know it does work. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's what I tell my patients sometimes. They ask me, why is it because I'm getting stronger? And the answer is, to be honest, I have no idea why it <laughs> makes you better necessarily, but it does. And uh, there's plenty of research saying that it does. I think we need more to understand why, but we know it does. The strengthening works uh, as to why, well, uh, watch this space, maybe another PhD or something for you, JF. <laughs> and, and on that, your, your PhD was on uh, running footwear and in particular looking at uh, a thing called the minimalist index. But, you know, in terms of knee osteoarthritis or symptomatic sore knees for runners, in brief terms, what advice might you give to a runner around their footwear considerations? We know that this is not the immediate thing to think about. You've shared so clearly that we need to consider the loading, controlling the loading on the joint, monitoring the symptoms, listening to the body. 
But when it comes to footwear, what would be some advice, JF? Yeah, I, I like that you said, Brad, that you know, footwear is one piece of the puzzle, but definitely not the first one that you want to address. So keep that in mind for sure. Um, what I will say about footwear is most people would believe that if you're adding more cushioning under your foot, you will decrease the impact or the load at your knees. Um, but what the research is actually suggesting is it is the opposite. Uh, so if you're having more cushioning, uh, a thicker shoe under, well, on your foot, you will most likely increase the impact or the loading at your knee. Um, and that's kind of counterintuitive for most people because they think that you will basically just absorb the impact with your shoe, but it's not the case. So what we know from the research now is that shoes change the way people run. Um, and what I mean by that is if you cannot feel the ground under your foot because you have more cushioning, you will tend to land a little bit harder. You won't feel it because you have so much padding on your foot, but the load that will be applied to your knee is gonna be greater. Uh, and for that reason, you know, if you have knee OA, uh, what I tell people usually is don't go to more cushioning. Um, and, you know, you can maintain the same level of cushioning if you're comfortable with that, if you like it, why not? Uh, but I have that tendency uh, to sometimes bring people to less cushioning. And you mentioned the minimalist index, Brad, and, and that's a scale uh, that was developed during my PhD with a group of 42 experts from 11 countries. Um, and it's giving a percentage of how minimalist the shoe is. So 0% minimalist means that it's a very thick, stiff, high drop shoe. And if you go to a 100% minimalist, then you have the Vibram five fingers, for example, that are, are very minimalist. And I, I never tell anyone you should go to 100%. I don't remember the last time I said that to anyone. But what we know from research, if you go around that 70-ish percent, which you still have some cushioning, you have minimal cushioning, it's a shoe that's uh, more flexible and has less drop, it will bring you most likely, not everyone, but a lot of people will change the way they run uh, somehow to reduce knee loading. So that's an, a piece of advice I give to, to some runners who ask me about footwear. Basically, don't go to more cushioning, um, stay the same, or you can even consider going to less cushioning. Ah, so so interesting. Uh, it's, it's counterintuitive once again. Uh, and there has been a real shift uh, from, you know, the early to mid 2010s to 15s where the minimalist shoe uh, world really exploded to then this swing to now the maximalist type shoe uh, really taking the, the lion's share of attention and marketing uh, for, for the average runner going into the running store. Uh, and I, I think just to drive home or reiterate that point, uh, when we have more under our foot, more stack height, which for the listener listening in wondering what stack height, just think simply of a Hoka type shoe, a Hoka S type shoe with that stack height, we do tend to uh, land heavier with more impact, which I guess if we took our shoes off and ran with bare no shoes, we're not endorsing that. Uh, the logic would be that there'll be less impact. Absolutely. And, what I would say is if, if you're making that choice of going to a more minimalist shoe, you just want to make sure that you're allowing for some transition time. So don't shift all of a sudden your 30 kilometers per week to a new shoe that's way more minimalist. Uh, and we, we have developed some some tools at the running clinic, try to, um, you know, come up with recommendations. It seems like, you know, if you're going it, let's say to a, from a 30% on the index to a 70% on the index. So you have a 40% difference. According to the research that we have, it would be roughly uh, one month of transition time for every 10 to 20% on the index. So going from 30% to 70%, you should allow somewhere between two to four months to fully transition your weekly volume 
to that new shoe. So you would gradually add uh, more minutes of running with your new shoe during your week, but still completing your volume with your older shoe until you reach that full transition point, just to make sure you don't get another injury. So it's important not to make too big of change too quickly and uh, to wean one out as the other weans in. Uh, Really practical there. Uh, JF and if you could give some examples this is not an endorsement of any specific shoe but uh, when a runner when a listener hears a 70% minimalist shoe index like what are some of the sort of shoes that a runner might readily recognize to be uh, to be in that that category if you like yeah Um, and and if you're interested we have a full listing of hundreds and even thousands of models now on the running clinics website uh, just so people know like what the rating is and they can calculate their own rating if the shoe is not listed there there's a a calculator uh, so you can test your own Uh, but as an example if you have a a Saucony um, A8 for example or um, I'm just trying to think of specific models. I, I lost uh, the, the latest ones this year. There were too many changes in, in my mind. Uh, but you can have a look on the website. Uh, so, you know, you can go that 70 percent is not extreme. Right. So just keep in mind that if you say, oh, I would like to reduce knee loading and you're going to that about 70 percent, it's not extreme. Like I'll go to Saucony again, but a Saucony Kinvara, which is a quite um, popular shoe. You know, people say it's only a four millimeter drop and, and that shoe is, is more on the minimal side of things. Yes and no. So that one actually rates about uh, 50% on the index because it's still, it, there's still some thickness of the heel there and uh, it's a little bit stiffer as well. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it depends on many different features and the Hoka's now, they used to rate closer to 0%. But now they made them lighter, so uh, for that reason, they they tend to be around the thirty or even forty percent because they're so uh, they're so light and they have a low drop, but they're still very thick. And do check out uh, if you're listening the, the the minimalist index that you've referenced there, JF, on the Running Clinics uh, website. It's a terrific resource for runners and uh, practitioners alike. And JF, just to briefly touch on technique. What tips might you give to someone to consider what's, what, what may they pay attention to with their running gait or technique? Um, yeah, well, we're actually conducting some research on that, or maybe I should say we're going to before COVID hit and, and uh, we had to stop our, our research. But uh, we're looking at how some gait modifications can affect knee loading uh, in people with OA. And there's a lot out there in healthy runners or runner, younger runners with knee pain. Um, so I, I'll just base my recommendations off of that. And it seems like taking shorter steps or increasing your cadence is a, a big one that you can do. Uh, what I mean by a big one is personally my favorite uh, because there's no real risk of that. Um, you're reducing the load everywhere. So if you say, you know, I'm running it five minutes per kilometer usually, um, and I'm taking 160 steps per minute, well, increasing by seven and a half to 10% your cadence, so going to 170 to 176-ish, can help to significantly reduce knee loading. So that's my go-to personally. The second one I like to use is try to run softer. So when you're landing, try to, to not make as much noise when you're landing. Uh, and different people will do it differently, but uh, the take-home message is just try to run softer. And there's a bunch of other ones that you can use, but I, I personally, those are my two favorite ones to help reduce knee loading. Yeah, so practical, run softer uh, and consider increasing your cadence. JF, this has been uh, really insightful. This is a tough question, but if you had to boil everything you've learned through your professional career to date into one solitary or single piece of advice to help the listener of this show, uh, let's let's uh, get specific, navigate knee osteoarthritic symptoms. What would that one piece of advice be when it comes to running? You know, if I would want to keep it very, very simple, I would say listen to your body. Um, And that listen to your body is based on 
uh, all the stuff that we've discussed on this on this podcast, right? So if you do have that pain uh, going above two out of ten when you're running and you have a way, may not be ideal. If the pain stays for more than an hour after your run, again, you may be overloading, and the stiffness when you get up in the morning is also key. And I, I like to stay quite broad like this simply because different people will have different symptoms and you know they'll, they'll interpret them differently. So I think uh, if I gave you a program and I said, okay, run max 30 minutes, well, for someone it may be totally fine, but for someone else it may be too much. So I like just to go with the listen to your body and that's, I think, the best piece of advice we can give as a physio. Uh, so, so powerful. JF, every guest of the show issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week. So what is JF's physical challenge going to be? <laughs> Um, so l let's try something that would be um, applicable to what we discuss on the podcast. Uh, if, for example, if you're used to running an hour uh, in, in one day and you've never tried it, I would suggest that you try splitting that up into two different sessions. So go run 30 minutes in the morning and go run 30 minutes later that day uh, just to try and see what it feels like to distribute that load. And you'll see that even in a healthy runner, uh, someone who doesn't have knee pain, it can be quite interesting to add to your training, those double units or um, or running twice a day. So try that at home this week. We'll call it the JF Split Session Challenge. <laughs> that sounds great, Brad. <laughs> and JF, for the listener wanting to follow your work more, and uh, let's, let's just re reiterate the importance uh, of please jumping on and completing the perceptions about running and knee health survey, where can you practically direct people to go? So for that, they can just go on uh, my Twitter profile. Um, so if you follow me on Twitter at JF, E S C U L I E R J F S Q D A. Um, the link is right there. It's my pinned tweet. So feel free to fill that out. That'd be great. Ideally, you should have done it already. You shouldn't have waited until the end of this podcast. Uh, but uh, feel free to send it to your friends and family and colleagues. That would be awesome. And retweet while you're there on Twitter. Retweet it. Uh and uh, and JF, the running clinic dot com uh, is such a great resource for recreational, uh, competitive, and health practitioners alike. Uh, I love the uh, the vision being the worldwide reference in the prevention of running injuries by promoting the best practices related to runners' health, with the philosophy being the kick out the simpler the better. So well done, team. Keep that keep that resource built in. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. And yeah, the simpler the better because we we just feel like a lot of people overcomplicate stuff. And, and, you know, footwear is a great example. Do we need that much technology in the shoes? Do we need to have that much cushioning? And uh, that's why we like the simpler the better as our approach <laughs> for many different things. And uh, as former uh, featured expert shared, Dr. Stephen Seiler, uh, keep it simple, scientist. <laughs> yeah, that's great. The KISS principle. <laughs> Can't beat it. JF, uh, you're also sharing uh, around this topic on the Masters athlete online symposium august the 8th uh, free registration for anyone listening in uh, it's going to be a great day with other uh, speakers so we're looking forward to hosting you there as well absolutely and looking forward to that event if you want to know more about uh, some of the things we we talked about today so that will be with slides and you get uh, more the visual explanations that go with uh, what we discussed here so i think it's going to be a, a really great event also with all the other speakers jf Scullier, thank you for your contribution to the Physical Performance Show and all that you're uh, you're providing in the world of running and, uh, and and sports medicine. Thank you so much, Brad, for having me. It was a pleasure to be part of your podcast, a very famous podcast. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show, and I trust and I know you enjoyed the sharings from JF Escoulier. And please, if you didn't stop the show midway through the episode, then please jump over and do complete the survey. You'll find it pinned on JF Escoulier's Twitter feed at JF Escoulier, E-S-C-U-L-E-R. 
L-I-E-R on Twitter or simply jump over to pogophysio.com.au for the show notes and there you'll find the survey link. It's very important work and I certainly know the listeners of this show can support the research project with our collective insights into the topic. I've completed it and the educational module at the end is exceptional. A big thanks to those posting podsies over on Instagram. You'll find the Physical Performance Show easily at Physical Performance Show. You'll find myself at Brad underscore beer and you'll find the show on Facebook as well. A massive thanks to those as always leaving ratings and reviews for the show over on iTunes. Those reviews really do serve as rocket fuel for the show. And if you've been enjoying a handful of episodes and please consider jumping over to iTunes from your phone, your laptop, or your device, and leaving a simple review and a rating. Don't forget to hit subscribe to the show to ensure the Physical Performance Show lands in your earbuds each and every week. Massive thanks, as always, to the great folk who make the show possible, Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin on all things show administration, Matthew Alding, all things show graphic design, and Lily Burden assisting with the Physical Performance Show's social media. If you're yet to register for the upcoming Masters Athletes Online Symposium co-hosted by the Physical Performance Show and Benoit Matthew, UK-based physical therapist, then please do jump over and register. It's completely free. Jump over to masterathletes.online, masterathletes, all one word, lowercase, dot online. If you are greater than 35 years of age, either working or competing in sports, then this event is for you. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, we keep the expert edition theme going. It's a topic long overdue that we will be exploring, and that is the topic of mental health for athletes. The next week's featured expert is Dr. Emmett Mystery, sports and exercise psychiatrist. That's right, psychiatrist. Dr. Mystery is the clinical lecturer in sport and exercise medicine. He's the chair of the Royal College of Psychiatrists Sport and Exercise Special Interest Group, and he recently co-authored a wonderful publication, Case Studies in Sports Psychiatry. It's an absolutely critical conversation to absorb where we cover key topics such as exercise addiction, What is it? What are the potential side effects? How do you know if you are suffering from it? And what role personality traits play in its development? Dr. Mystery shares insights around ADHD in sport, depression and anxiety, and the role that perfectionism can play in sports performance. We all know it's a critical and delicate time for the mental health of everyone worldwide. So this is an expert edition you are not going to want to miss. So until next week, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this is the Physical Performance Show.